and welcome to the MBS Show Discussion Podcast. I am your host, Norman Senso. Joining me today is Silver Quill. I attack writers for a living, but not really. <laughs> uh, so wait, you're a pony reviewer, you do comics, you write for EQD, and now you're telling me that you attack writers, but not really. Hmm, fascinating. My life is a grand paradox of emotion. Hmm, I can see why they say death of the author, because you kill them. <laughs> That's right. Well, you know, they say dying is the best thing you can do for your career. <laughs> oh, boy. Well, anywho, also joining us is Wills. Ah, well, if you need someone to talk about writers, why not ask a writer himself? And what qualifies me being a writer? Why? Simple. I don't write. <laughs> At all. I guess you're wrong, then. You're the right kind of wrong. <laughs> no, I'm the pretentious kind of wrong. <laughs> Oh, I, I'm a writer. Oh, really? What have you written? Uh, uh, stuff you wouldn't know. Fifty Shades. Ah, <laughs> <laughs> oh, please. But anywho, this discussion is brought to you by our Patreon supporter, Nimbra Kutorius. Thank you so much for the support. And he asked for us to, well, in to summarize what he said, um, he wants us to talk about the Season 6 newer writer crew. And... Are they any good? Do we like them? And what do we, and are we looking forward for their work in season seven? And also, what do you think about Josh Haber and do we miss AKR? Um, I think let's go for those two first, Josh Haber and AKR, because, well, they're well established. They have written a lot of episodes beforehand. So let's go round table. Silver, what do you think about Josh? Well, I enjoyed his work. I, I don't often worry about who's writing an episode because then you start, then I notice you have this annoying habit of judging the episode's worth before it's even aired. It's like, er, this was done by X, therefore it's going to be so, so mediocre relying on these old tropes. And I feel like you, you shut down opportunity when you do so. But wouldn't that also bring up the point of view of, oh, he has this bad habit that he has when doing certain things with the episode. So when you look at it or when you notice it, like, ah, yes, this is, quote unquote, the, um, uh, who was one of the, Ted Anderson, was it? One of the writers? No, um, the artist. Was it Ted that likes to put in the goblins? Oh, Tony Fleece. Yeah, sorry, Tony Fleece. So it, it'll be something similar to that where, ah, Josh likes to do this kind of things in his writing, or Tony Fleece likes to add in the goblins in the background when he does his um, drawings and stuff like that. I feel like that's the story within behind the story. It's like two separate things. Uh, ultimately, if a if a if a story is good, I celebrate why it's good. I don't say, oh, it's because this writer was working on it. But then you say, okay, when I look at this writer's collection of works, I might notice a trend. But I feel like that's two separate realms. But Judge Haber, he wrote some fun episodes. I can't say he's they were my favorite episodes. I'm actually scrolling through the MLP wiki as we speak, just trying to refamiliarize myself with what has been done. Well, he started off in season four, and his first writing gig for the ponies is Castlemania. A lot of people were mixed on this one, if I remember right. It was fun. It was it was a episode where you didn't have a physical antagonist beyond the very confusing Castle of the Two Sisters. If anything, the greatest fears I learned from that episode is that Celestia has a weird sense of humor. <laughs> yeah, and the second thing that he wrote for Ponies was Simple Ways. And wow, I remember a lot of people really, really, really liking this one. They really like it. I really like it. A lot of his projects in season six were collaborative. He was a co-writer on many an episode. He is missed, but at the same time, I'm not like this show isn't the same without him. I don't mean to make that sound dismissive, but it's just what I see. All right, then. And Wills, what about you? As it goes for writers like Josh, um, my opinions are almost exactly like Silver. I mean, it doesn't really come down to the writers who's writing. I mean, the only person I can really think of as... The bad, you know, I'm not even going to say their name, all right? There's been people who have said, you know, this person's a bad writer because they did a few bad episodes. And really, when it comes down to it, um, I mean, I will say when it came to Josh's episodes, I was a bit more entertained. I found, found the characters to be funnier. At least that was just my opinion. 
like you were saying about Castlemania, I mean, you know, that was a pretty good episode and, you know, every character seemed to be, you know, adding something to the plot. I mean, even though Pinky didn't have her punch, she was the punchline of that episode. We can just say that she was the punchline of the episode. But yeah, I don't really have much else to add about Josh's work. Mm-hmm. Um, all right, yeah. all right. And for me with Josh here, I don't know. I mean, when it comes to writers in the, in the general scope of things, I don't really notice anything when it comes to the writers. Like, I see an episode, I enjoy it, I say that, hmm, this episode's good. And one of the few things that I, well, I admit this is a bad habit, that I don't blame the writers. Well, when it's good, I don't blame the writers. When it's bad, I'll straight away go for the writers. Like, it's really bad habit for me because if it's good, it's bad, they should get the praise and they should get the scolding. But in Josh's case here, He's slowly getting into that trend of, hmm, how should I write for the characters here? Like, in season 4, he has written for 3 episodes, Castlemania, Simple Ways, and also Leap of Fate. I think most of the writers here are getting their stride back. And as time goes on, when we reach season 6, he's the guy that spearhead the first 2 episodes. And you know what? He was also involved in... The Fault in Our Cutie Mark. Um, also, those are collaborative work with Ed Valentine and Megan McCartney, but still, he's involved in some shape or form. And he was the guy responsible to wear him back again. So, I think when it comes to Josh here, it's hard to say. Like, I don't really notice a pattern with um, some of the writers. But what I would like to say is that when it comes to writers, uh, for example, AKR, uh, Amy Keating Rogers, you'll get to see that hmm, this writer really understands a character. Like, for example, AKR does a lot of good Pinkie Pie episodes. So if she starts writing for a Pinkie episode, then ah, this is going to be a good one. Or if we look at some writers who specialize in certain characters like uh, Twilight. Mm, I, I don't really have a, f- a finger to point when it comes to certain characters. But you get the point. Talking about EKR, how about you guys? What do you think of her? And, well, do you miss her? She is a, such a unique paradox. If you go by her list, she's written some of the best and some of my least favorite episodes, or at least different presentations as such. I mean, let's, let's run down the line here. She helped write The Ticketmaster with Lord and Faust, Apple Buck Season, Bridal Gossip, <laughs> Fall Weather Friends, A Dog and Pony Show, The Best Night Ever, uh, Cutie Pox, The Last Roundup, which is, okay, Last Roundup might be one of the most controversial episodes, thanks to a certain gray cross-eyed mayor. Yeah, yeah. A Friend Indeed, Mystery on the Friendship Express, Pinky Pride, co-writer, mm-hmm. Philly Vanilli, one of the best Fluttershy episodes, one of the worst Pinkie Pie episodes. Yeah. Testing, testing, one, two, three. Lost Treasure, Griffinstone, Canterlot Boutique, Crusaders of the Lost Mark. She gave them their cutie marks. The main attraction, which was her last one. In fact, she referenced all her previous episodes in that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And she's been a staple of this. And in some ways, I think she celebrated a lot of these characters well. I think sometimes she didn't quite get them right. She was never a fan of Spike. And... This this is definitely the story behind the story. At BabsCon, she has expressed her dislike of Spike several times. And in some ways, given the, the growth that Spike has enjoyed over the past couple seasons, perhaps we needed the distance from that particular attitude to make him work. Mm, yeah, I, I can see that because when it comes to certain writers, they have their favorites. And when it comes to uh, Miss Rogers here, she loves the pinky but has a hard time dealing with Spike. So, mm, I, I can see what you mean. Like, for example, if we have her on in Season 7 and she writes for Spike, um, I don't think that she'll be giving Spike the limelight as they speak. Exactly so. And, Wills, what about you? Dang it, Silver, stop stealing all my good points. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah, that was the only complaint I had about her work was just how Spike was treated in them. And to, to be honest, though, um, not that any of the writers we're going to talk about later did any episodes that really made Spike shine through. I mean, most are, I mean, all the episodes they have, they have done have been mostly, uh, other character centric and whatnot. But, um, 
There was one she did that actually I really liked. The one where she did a collaboration with uh, Jason Thiessen, uh, Pinky Pride. That was one of my particular favorite episodes because I think when it comes down to her, from what I've seen from her episodes, yeah, she does Pinky well. Mm -hmm. And that's being one of my top favorite characters. That's what I really liked about her. And for me, when it comes to Amy here, I do highly enjoy A Friend Indeed. A Friend Indeed is one of those episodes where I would say it's one of the best Pinkie Pie episodes out there. It shows her strong point and it shows her weak points. But in the end, she learns something out of it. And also the song is too good. Oh yeah, don't forget the smile song was like... Oh, All rise for the Brony National Anthem. <laughs> yeah, I mean, when, when, the, when this song was leaked on 4chan... Gosh, people didn't know if it was fake or if it was real. And then when it did become a song, everyone lost their minds. Yeah, because this song, like, like I mentioned before, too good. Uh, but still, in, in the end, guys, what do you think? Like, do you miss her? Do you want more of her? I wouldn't mind uh, if she came back to do some stuff. I mean... Yeah, there, I don't think there's any writer who I, I'd say, oh, I never want them to come back ever. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, true that. Hit the road, Jack. Well, honestly, I don't mind her coming on guest writing for the show again. It'll be fun to see because, like Silver mentioned, she wrote the main attraction, one of her last works, and that was a piece of nice work from her. That is just too good. And the song, oh yeah, yeah, so good, just too good. It was the best Applejack episode. Ain't no thing to, uh, to dismiss. Yep, yep. Though, to be fair, I kind of wish she had come back to write rock-solid friendship. <laughs> and maybe Pinky would have been a little less annoying. Well, if we're gonna, if we're gonna hold things to that, uh, poor Pinky was also the victim of Philly Vanilli, where she uh. was grade A psychopath. <laughs> yeah. We must, we must... Let me stalk you while I'm climbing up this wall like Spider-Man. Which is quite terrifying. Yeah. To put it simply, every author has their high points and their low points. And I think you have to take both into consideration. Some people only want to focus on the negative. Yeah. But, like, all of the writers here, they have the strong and weak points. Like, nobody's perfect. And also, as a bonus here, I'm just going to mention Larson. I miss Larson. I want him on again. Thanks, M.A. Larson. <laughs> no, I'd actually mean that. <laughs> yeah. Yes, thank you for all your wings and everything else. Yeah, his last work I noticed is uh, Amending Fences. So, could that possibly Aww. a story for the fandom? <laughs> ah, reading things over. <laughs> no, no. If anything, if he probably just would have backflipped while flipping, <laughs> backflipped off of a shark while flipping everybody off <laughs> over explosion. Oh, right. Then. But anywho, those, well, are Josh and Amy. But let's get into the meat of the story here, which is the newer writers. And newer writers for season 6 are Michael P. Fox and Will Fox. They've written The Gift of the Mod Pie, Applejack's Day Off, and Pony Point of View. Let's start off with this group here first, and their episodes. What do you think of them? Well, should we tackle this by the author sets, starting with, like, the foxes? Yes, let's go with the foxes first. Easily, um, we divide and conquer. Divide and conquer. Thank God it isn't Fox News. <laughs> Ugh. Fair and balanced, my patoot. <laughs> well, let's just hope their writing here is fair and balanced between the two of them. Well, let's see here. Looking at this, I think Applejack's Day Off is probably the weakest entry simply because it was very low energy and not a lot was happening. Mm -hmm. uh, I will say that sometimes the... Looking at these, I think the biggest criticism is that sometimes the characters are not seeing what we consider obvious solutions. Yeah, I see what you mean by this because um, out of the, I'm not 100 percent sure if Pony point of view, but out of the two episodes here, um, there's an easy solution for both, and that's just to sit down and talk about it. Well, I guess you could talk, although there'd be a lot more shouting. Pony Point of View might be the one where the answer is the most obscure, because only Twilight knows about the Trihorn Bunyip. <laughs> and we know how you like the Bunyip, Silver. I do love the Bunyip. The Bunyip is so cute. He's a puppy. But um, talking about Pony Point of View, I I do like this one because of 
how they portray the uh, three characters here because we as fans kind of know how they're supposed to act. We've been seeing this show for a while now, so we have a general idea of how they're supposed to act. But having um, our expectations of how the character is supposed to act through out the window by uh, pushing their negative traits to 11 is fun. And uh, do keep in mind of all the sad, poor, lonely souls who decided to do a drinking game every time Rudy says darling. <laughs> <laughs> oh, the pain. The pain. Uh, well, Pirate Applejack's cool. <laughs> yar, har, 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 har. Uh, but still, but still. And of course, Pinky, who got extended to, I brought a stick! <laughs> I guess, I, I, I guess if you guys can make me laugh by just refereeing this is a good thing, I guess. Yeah, it's a, a nothing to worry about. Oh man, that bunny point of view had so many good things about it though. Actually, that's a question. Do the writers decide anything that's going, do they just write the base script? Or do they also, are they also responsible for storyboards? Or is that completely separate? Hmm. I imagine they start the ball rolling, but then you've got to turn it over to someone else or you're yeah, in trouble. Because from mm. what I'm seeing here on the wiki page is, um, story is by Kevin Burke, Christy Doc White, Michael P. Fox, and Will Fox, um, written by the Foxes, and storyboard. Ah, storyboard. Uh, storyboard here is by another group of people, um, Ward, Ward Jenkins and Hannah Lee. Okay, okay. So the story writer is probably just responsible for the base script. Mm -hmm. So when it comes to it, they decided the flow, they decided the narrative, and they decided what character would say when. So you got to judge it on that part. So it gets a little bit trickier then because a good storyboarder can make even the dullest of scripts great. But even then, sometimes you could be handed a very blasé script and it becomes very hard to work with. Probably, but still, um, talking about Blase, Applejack's Day Off, this one has a lot of complaints with this. Like, Silva mentioned that it's low energy. And yeah, I can see why, because this is just, hmm, how do I put this? Not much action. A lot of talking, no action. All talk, no shock. And the solution for the problem is so obvious. If you sit down and look at things in a different perspective, it's easily solvable. But I think I mentioned that I like this episode because of the lesson. The way that it's told is something else, but I do like the lesson that's being told. Sometimes you get so wrapped up in your own thing that you've been doing for so long, you don't even realize what's going on. Yep, you need a fresh point of view to kind of tell you what's going on, which is a lesson that we all could have. And surprisingly enough, there is a biblical quote that is actually very close to that lesson. Oh, Remove the splinter from thine own eye before you remove the log from someone else's. Mm. Uh, all right. No, wait. That's actually backwards. Dang, I screwed it up. <laughs> I, I, I don't deserve to be Catholic. Uh, but then we ain't judging. We ain't judging. I'm looking for a 10-foot pole, <laughs> and even then I'm afraid to touch it. <laughs> uh, and the gift of the mod pie. This one was a fun one, but I don't know. What, what do you guys think? Oh, that was. Oh, go ahead. You go first, Silver. You first. Oh, come on! I, I seem to keep stealing your points, so you you first. Okay. Well, the the story that's based off the gift of the Magi. Um, it, this story kind of falls a little bit flat because you know they're both supposed to give up something in order for it to actually mean anything. So just by Pinky being the only one that gives up something, so she's the only one that loses something in the end. It kind of loses half the meaning of the original. Uh, Story, fable, tale? I forget what, I forget what it's classified as. Okay, rarity covering for Pinkie Pie and even, uh, Tabitha St. Germain impersonating Pinkie Pie for just a little bit is kind of worth some of, <laughs> some of it. But the story itself just felt, um, if you're gonna do the fable, you gotta do it at least by the same beats. If you change it too much, you gotta be sure that the meaning still means the same thing. If you change too much, then you just, you lose the meaning, you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, we get you, dog. I'm straight up with that for shizzle. <laughs> Yo. Not grizzle. Uh, and Silver, what about you, man? Many of the same points. I, the gift of the Magi is meant to be a mutual sacrifice, even though, believe me, people have debated at length about uh, the woman's hair. 
Hmm. So, uh, I think really Rarity was the most fun seeing her imitate Pinkie Pie. Mm-hmm. And I think a lot of that has to do with Tabitha St. Germain's uh, talent rather than specifically uh, the, the writing. But it, it was a fun episode. It was enjoyable. Uh, so I'm all for it. I think these guys have done a good job. They're not quite at perfection just yet. Yeah, I agree with that one. Like, for me, the gift of the Mod Pie, the most um, outstanding thing about this episode is rarity because the way that she acts in this one is just too good. It's just too good. If we're getting them how they've been going, they have been getting better with each one they've done. At least that's my thoughts on it. Mm, true, true. And well, um, for you people who are living in Canada today, um, Philly Forever? Sorry, no, that was yesterday. But yeah, for people who have seen Philly Forever, that's one of their latest episodes for season seven. And I like that one. That one was fun. Oh, was yeah. Fun. F- f- Philly Forever, just saw that. That was good. Mm-hmm. It was a little bit lower energy, much like the criticisms of uh, Fluttershy leans in. Mm-hmm. I, I felt like there was there was no wolf at the door, mm-hmm. but in a slice of life, sometimes there doesn't have to be. Mm-hmm. Well, well, we'll hold our overall thoughts for season seven when it comes. But I'm just pointing out that that's one of their newer episodes because you have to see where they came from and where they are now. And looking at how the foxes are. I say that they have a trend of taking low pace episodes and finding the deeper meaning out of it. But anywho, um, those are the Foxes. And the next one on the list is Mike Vogel or Michael Vogel. <laughs> I don't know if we can cover each episode because he's been prolific. Yeah. And well, most of them are co-written at the same time too. So I'm just going to see if I can find. Yep. Okay. There's an episode. A heartwarming tale. This one is an episode where it's his first writing episode, and it's a solo one. So let's judge this one, shall we? Well, I'll I'll state right now that I'm very biased in favor of Mike Vogel because I got to interview him uh, in a panel at BabsCon, and so I know his history a little bit better. I know his perspective a bit more than I do any of the other writers. Mm. So please do enlighten us, my friend. <laughs> well, let's see here. One. He's always nurtured be, being a big kid at heart, uh, at which point I asked, has Tom Hanks tried to sue you on that? <laughs> uh, he started doing temp jobs in L.A. for all the big production companies. And in time, he made friends with other people working in production. Uh, early stuff was clearing scripts, just making sure that there weren't any copyright or legal issues with saying a name or using Uh, like a parody of a character, The Incredibles being a good example. Mm -hmm. But over time, he worked his way up to the corporate side of things. He was vice president of development for Hasbro Studios. And when it's funny that we both remark that when you say a word like corporate or uh, vice president, you imagine a a sort of stuffy suit kind of guy. Yeah. But no, this is still very rooted in creativity. But this is the part I, I love. He went to Burning Man. And he came back realizing that he'd gone the corporate route, but he never wanted to be corporate. (laughs) So he resigned and pretty much on the same day got hired as a writer by DHX for the episodes. Oh, my. So here's the image of a man going out into the desert, having a revelation and returning to the normal world with a new purpose, which I find a magnificent allegory of sorts. And how is he doing now, by the way? Well, looking at his list, even if it is collaborations, he, he's done very well, in my opinion. Uh, God, I love the heartwarming tale. Yeah, the heartwarming tale, even though a bit cliche in terms of its story, I like it here. Um, it's a pony version of the same story, but with the pony twists. But he's also done Stranger Than Fan Fiction, which I think is his most clever. I think that was a collaborative work, mm-hmm. but still one of the most clever episodes on the list. He mentioned that he really liked Starlight Glimmer because controversial characters are the most interesting. Well, considering he's written every little thing she does and to wear him back again, he might be filling in M.A. Larson's role as the most controversial <laughs> episode writer. Yep, yep. And you know what? Talking about controversial writings, um, he did The Cart Before the Ponies, which a lot of people seem to dislike because, oh, this episode is terrible. Yeah. But I find it entertaining. Plus, go-kart ponies. Yay. 
I did love that Derby Racer song. Yep. yep. And, uh, you know, no, you don't like it, Will? Oh, no, I love the Derby Racer ah. song. I love Charlie and that. <laughs> oh, you. But as it comes down, as it comes down to it, uh, what you were talking about, but for a heartwarming tale, yeah, um, it, Mike Vogel's individual stuff. Um, I actually have to say, when I, what I've seen from his work, he always seems to have, well, uh, to the opposite of what the Fox Brothers um, seem to have, they, he seems to have a lot of energy into his writing. Like everything seems to build up to a nice bombastic sort of, e- even the short things like. Uh, uh, like dirt, the uh, cart before the ponies that builds up uh, on its really cool song mm-hmm. and it's to a gigantic crash and hearts warming tail. Okay. Hearts warming tail just like really ramps up the whole, I mean, we already know the whole um, Christmas Carol mm-hmm, story mm-hmm. that everyone's doing, but so it's always bring out the big gun and guns for the third spirit and dang, did they bring out the guns for the third oh, spirit? Talking about that, right? Um, Spice Up Your Life is another episode I enjoy. And the song in that one was, oh my goodness, it was just too awesome. And actually, um, well, that one didn't do the whole build up into explosive. It did have a nice ending to it, a nice conclusion of some critics are just jerks. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Some. Well, you're... hey, not not you, Silver. You're not a jerk. <laughs> oh, we didn't mean it that way, Silver. You're an egomaniacal supervillain. Oh, thank you. I'm glad someone understands me. <laughs> <laughs> but still, I do agree with you guys when it comes to Mike Vogel here. He has this roller coaster ride of, okay, first his stagnance goes up in build up, and it has a really good payout. So yeah, I do notice that and I like it. Let's see here. So I, I would say Cart Before the Ponies is probably the the weakest entry. But again, that was I believe that was a collab and basically I guess this is the most recurring criticism I have for episodes in seasons uh, six and seven thus far. The ones that avoid immediate conflict are usually the weaker entries because I think they assume that we, the audience, likely the intended audience, can't handle conflict. Probably. I, I'm not sure about that one. I personally do like the uh, conflict because it goes well with milk. <laughs> uh, terrible joke. But no, I do agree with you because it builds tension. Uh, building tension is something that you need in storytelling. Just a thought there. Mm-hmm. But it's all good. Yep. And, it's all good. Um, we move on to the next guy on the list, which is FM Marco, And Marco here did one episode for season six, and that is 28 Pranks Later. This one, previously we mentioned about this episode where I think people dislike it for reasons, and I'm not sure what those reasons are. I need to double check on them. But this is only one episode he written, and it's a collab with Megan McCartney. I've heard people say they dislike it because it rehashes um, Mer- uh, Mysterious Meredithwell, and I've heard people like it because it does Mysterious Meredithwell right. Hmm. So that that seems to be the thing I hear from both sides of the thing. It, always a comparison to that particular episode. I particularly just uh, like the whole calling back from uh, Zagora's first appearance. Uh, what if it's, it's zombies? He's like, so zombies exist in Equestria? Can we see that? <laughs> Many seasons later, zombies! Ponies. Yay. Cookie zombie ponies. I thought it was a pretty creative, fun way. Yes, I married well comparisons, but at the same time, there are no original stories anymore. Mm-hmm. True. Sometimes it's just the fun spin you take on a classic. And this was a fun spin on the classic zombie movie trope. Yep, yep. And I remember something. Um, people mentioned that they didn't like the out of character nature of some of the characters in this one. That's what I heard. I didn't think anyone was really too out of character. I mean, actually, if anything, I kind of think it's more in character. Like, Rainbow Dash has been pranking everybody. She pranked the entire town so much. They were like, yep, got to teach her a lesson. (laughs) She's got to go. Oh, gosh. Well, that's what I've heard. I personally have my own views on this episode, which I like the episode. It had this fun spin on the whole zombie movie trope where, oh, okay, uh, it's not magic. Oh, thank goodness it's not magic. And even though they had egg on their face, quote unquote, is Rainbow Dash that got the joke, not them. You know what I mean? The joke backfired. She got the last laugh? No, because, um, everybody would have, oh no, I have Rainbow 
thingies on my face. Ew, darn you, Rainbow Dash. But this is the other way around. There's some people who pay money for that. Oh, no, 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 no. Anyway, next person. <laughs> I, am, what, I am wondering what, what uh, I, mean, I am wondering what her plan was of like, okay, she's going to expect everyone to eat the cookies at the exact same time. What, what, why wouldn't someone just immediately open the box, eat the cookies, and then be like, come right out the door just two seconds later, hey, these cookies did something to me. <laughs> uh, do you expect everyone to just do it at night? Maybe, then? maybe po- ponies have uh, a set timetable for sweets? Probably. I don't really? Know. Then what's, then Pinky's stopwatch has to be going off every second. Ding, time for sweets. Ding, time for sweets. <laughs> oh, boy. Knowing the pig meister, I wouldn't be surprised. Oh, boy. Uh, okay. But anywho, moving on to the next guy or gal is Kevin Burke and Chris Doc Wyatt. So this guy's did the times they are a changeling, Viva Las Pegasus and Pony Point of View. Um, if you notice, we have a bit of repeat because, well, they're involved in some shiva form. They're they're a collaborative band, it seems, mm-hmm. which makes it kind of hard to, to talk about them specifically. If, in truth, I don't think we've gotten a chance to really, uh, yeah, we haven't got a chance to see their work solo. True, but still, is it that bad to see them work together with someone? Because usually, when you have two people working together, you get the both, you, you get the what you call this strong point of both person. But we've only seen them work with Mike Vogel, apparently, and uh, oh wait, sorry, Mike Vogel and uh, the Fox Brothers. So, so when it comes down to it, yeah, if you just judge their episodes, they'd be across the board. But now that they're working with people, it's like, uh, what do they bring to the table? We we don't know what they bring to the table yet. They have, we haven't seen their single piece. Actually, I wonder if they do a single piece in this coming season to look forward to. And I'm double checking, and no, nah, I don't see any. Yeah, well, we've only had uh, we've only had six episodes so far. To say who is writing for it? So mm, true, 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 true. But still, I think what we mentioned before can be translated over to this because, well, um, Pony Point of View, we like it because of the Bunyip, Viva Los Pegasus. I don't think we mentioned Viva Los Pegasus, but we I, personally, I like it because of how they con the con man. So yay. They've had a lot of episodes that introduce really fun elements to the world. Gladmain was a great villain and sociopath. <laughs> yep. Uh, let's see. They introduced Thorax. Mm-hmm. You can't say that, that not a good episode if it doesn't introduce Thorax. Yeah, true. But at the same time, too, um, Mike Vogel was involved. So um, collaborative work here. So, yeah, I don't know. It's one of those things where they're there, but... Hmm, who's responsible for this? Uh, it's a collaborative effort. We like the episode, so yay. It's a group effort. Go team! <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Remember, it isn't just the writers that make this thing story. It's the animators and the storyboards and the voice actors. It's a collaborative effort to bring these things to the table. True that. But when somebody screws up, it's always the writer's fault. <laughs> Or the director's fault. <laughs> oh, yes. Uh, but anywho, last one on the list is Jennifer... Skyly? And she wrote for... Skelly. Skelly, thank you. Uh, she wrote Buckable Season, and this one is an interesting one. Hey, if there were 2,000 of her, would she be a skeleton? <laughs> <laughs> Silver, you need to get your game up. Oh, come on. Don't put that weight on me. I can't handle a ton. <laughs> but Buckball Season, that one... How to describe that? I feel like... The big criticism for that one, it's basically that there wasn't a great moral about sportsmanship in that one. Mm -hmm. Oh, no, because at the end, it's like, ha, we totally beat you. It's like, yeah, you did. Yeah, we won in your face. Yeah, nice, nice guy, Dash. Nice, nice guy. Yeah. Except, you know, you didn't play. (laughs) Uh, They're there for moral support, guys. They're there for moral support. (laughs) Yeah, well, I to the moral. Yeah, I, I think uh, she's not like, supporting a moral right now, is she? The only thing she seems to be just supporting is her own ego. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, that's besides the... Well, well, our review is up there if you want to go look at it. But still, I think that this episode here... Mm, I, I don't know. This is uh, a solo work, by the way. So, um, Jennifer here, 
needs to prove herself even more. But personally, I like this episode because the lesson here is a interesting one because, like I mentioned before, when it comes to sports, things are strange. And usually stupid. Ah, uh, yes, that's that true. <laughs> that too. But at the same time, too, I really like how Jennifer here writes the story about, um. Snails? How she wrote snails was fantastic. Yeah, true. Oh, um, yeah, getting more characterization from our lovable little doof is, <laughs> yeah. it's, it's always a pleasure. True. But I was more thinking of the fact of writing a story that involves people who are not comfortable to work under pressure. Fluttershy and Pinkie Pie here were doing awesomely before uh, Rainbow Dash and Applejack here dropped the pressure bomb on them, saying that you need to win, you need to win, you need to win. And not only that, just t- having them train how ve- how Dash and Applejack would train, which wasn't anything how either of the characters would have done. It's like going against their character. True, true. And because of that, they pay the price of not performing well. Well, not performing well. They don't. They don't even want to perform. Yeah. They, they basically say we quit. <laughs> Just one of the best Fluttershy meltdowns. Yep. Yep. Uh, but still, um, those are the new writers for this season, and I think them Dracotorius also asked, "Are we looking forward for season seven? Well, them, uh, I think there's no stopping the season seven hype train because Canada doesn't want to stop. <laughs> yes, oh Canada. <laughs> What the hey do you think you're doing? <laughs> ah, yep. Yep. I mean, We're blasting through all the episodes at ludicrous speed. I, I am enjoying season seven thus far, but I am a little worried that we've, I've gained a new appreciation for what early episode leaks do to the fandom, if nothing else. And funny enough, I mentioned this to Calpine because, um, during the, earlier days of the pony fandom, getting leaks, like, just imagine, you remember the first pony leak we got, uh, that was, I think... I remember the Smile Song being the first major leak. Yeah. So that's me. That's that too. And I, I think one of the leaks involved a season two episode. It could be, mm, I forgot, but still, uh, way back when, getting leaks, they're just too awesome because of someone derp at iTunes or another country show it way in advance but now I think we're getting bombarded by pony content left right and center and once that's done we'll get the Equestria Girl special the three episodes um, Poland's going to show that during May uh, the state's going to get a DVD of that in August and end of the year or end of October, we are going to get the My Little Pony movie. So, pony content for this year alone has been crazy. Stunning. You hit the triple sevens on the jackpot of pony content. Yep. But, uh, I'm quoting Seth on this. Every time, every time Equestria Daily hits a hiatus, they, they lose people. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Folks just don't, just sort of lose the entertainment value and they head off and they some don't come back. And so to, f- and so with Canada forcing basically a faster hiatus oh, for some, yeah. many, uh, it is not an ideal situation. True. But at the same time too, some of the people, um, on the EQDs or most of the fandom here do want to watch the episode on the Discovery Channel. So they're not going to watch the Canadian release. Good on them for supporting their local station. Yay, go them. But still, um, spoilers are abound. So it's hard to kind of avoid said spoilers because um, with the schedule that is coming out now, um, the states are going to be two episodes behind now. Oh, not just not just two anymore. Canada's getting new episodes every weekend now. We're going to be... Half a season behind by the end of this. Uh, yeah, yep, yep, yep. Yeah, like today they're showing off. As of the date of this recording, it's going to be season seven, episode seven. You mean we're not live? But I was planning so many profanities. <laughs> oh no, the sweetie pot, please. Do, do go and stand by. Forget it. We'll do it live. <laughs> uh, but still, uh, 
I'm excited for season seven and the parental guide. Okay, you know what? I'm gonna spoil my stuff for a bit because I know. Uh, yay! We got Dash's parents today. Dang it! Ah, uh, yes. Okay. Yeah, anyway. We get Dash's parents, and we're supposed to get Applejack's parents. Well, uh, in a later episode, we're gonna see everybody's parents. Yay! yay. You get a parent. Except you're silver. <laughs> you get a parent, and you get a parent. But not you, Applejack. <laughs> It's apparent that your parents are dead. <laughs> oh no! Uh, we're mean. We're mean. But uh, so. I'm really, just learning. <laughs> By the way, I, I'm sorry, Will. I didn't quite hear what you said, but it sounded it sounded like it was funny. Oh, I just said is like, uh, and we'll know everyone's parents except yours, Silver. You don't have any. Aww. You were born in the test tube. I was born for the chaos of the fandom. Oh no. <laughs> Must have been a very, very summer whirlwind romance. Well, the fans were riding themselves over, if you know what I mean. Oh gosh. Oh. Uh, but that's right. I, I thought you would. <laughs> uh, but anywho, um, that's the discussion for this episode. I think we covered everything that Nem wanted us to talk about, and yeah, I, I think we covered everything that he wanted us uh, wanted us to talk about. But anywho, um. That's our discussion for the writers for season six. And well, if you guys would like to get this kind of discussion going, you can do so by supporting us on the Patreon, which is patreon.com slash MBS show. A dollar gets you a thank you. Five dollars will get you a thank you and also a topic of discussion or a review you do that you want us to do. Um, I would like to thank Lurker Cats, Twilight Genesis, Member Dragoturius, Starstream and also myself like thank you very much for the support. So before I release you guys, what do you guys think? Like anything to add on? I like I say, there's no writer who I wish would just go away and never work for the show again. I feel like they've done even the episodes that didn't do great still performed well and gave us something to talk about and enjoy. So my hat's off to all these writers for their hard work and what they've provided to this fandom. Mm. Oh, by the way, Silver, I forgot to mention, when it, you mention a lot on your retrospective videos on, well, on your own channel, and that is the death of the author, do you think this applies? Well, when I talk about episodes, yes. I think the death of the author should apply. Sometimes, like with the good, the bad, and the ponies, you can just say, I don't see Twilight Sparkle in this story. I see... A mare that looks like her, but isn't behaving like her. But other than that, usually I just say, this is something new about the character. Let's integrate them. Uh, and that's often how I try to approach this. I'm grateful to these folks for their hard work and their creativity. But at the same time, I want to talk about the show as the show and these characters that are so diverse and enjoyable. I agree with you on that one, too, because personally for me or us, when we review a show, we don't judge the show because, oh... This writer's involved, so it's going to be terrible. No, we review it for its own merits. Because, well, if we were to prejudge an episode because of a certain writer involved, that's not fair. I guess if we bring that up, we should at least address the elephant in the room. A lot of people were harsh on Meriwether Williams for her various episodes. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. And Uh, yet, I didn't see any complaints for Bats, and we learned later that was her work. Mm-hmm. Well, Mary Meredith Williams, like, if we go way back to the critic machine, Mary Meredith Williams, I don't notice, like, I got no idea why people are angry or just not happy with it. Well, she wrote Mary Do Well, which was one of the more infamous episodes. True, but that was her first writing experience with the show, so she's still getting into the groove. She did write Heartswarming Eve and Putting Your Hoof Down. And also Dragon Quest, so you have to give points there. Well, like I say, she's a good demonstration of how people will prejudge based on simply seeing a writer's credit. I, I see what you mean there. And to me, once an episode's out, the thing like you mentioned before, the death of the author kicks in because it's our interpretation of how we look at said episode or content. So it's good times all around. <clears throat> mm-hmm. And Wills, any last words to say about um, this topic? Just that I think we give writers too much guff and too much credit at the same time. Keep in mind they're just writing the scripts of this. They're not the one. Uh, they they just write the bare bones. They write the they write the skeleton of the show. They make the framework, but then it's 
the storyboarders who bring that script into a vision and then the voice actors who bring those characters to life and then the animators who then flow the entire thing together into a cohesive whole and the editors who make everything make sense and the sound designers who make you actually hear things mm-hmm. and so the fans who get really really pissy with with what didn't work <laughs> yeah 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 so base an entire episode's plus and minus is entirely on writing it's kind of like looking at someone and saying, well, hey, your skeletal structure sucks. Well, I'm just big bone. <laughs> yeah. And yeah, I, I think that's a good drop off point for us because, well, we can go for hours or days talking about this because, well, we're human. We have opinions and, well, we want to share oh, it. Oh, God, do we have opinions? <laughs> yes, yeah, true. But anywho, Silver, what are you going to do next week? Well, I believe that having covered one episode of the Season 7 premiere, we should now cover the other episode. Yes, which is rare because we usually do it back-to-back. But no, not this time around because somebody decided not to do a two-part. Oh, there it is. There's there's us getting all pissy about things. (laughs) But hey, yes, next week we are going to review Episode 2 of Season 7, All Bottled Up. Uh, But anywho, I have been Norman Sanzo. I am the Silver Queen. I am the Will I Zen. And we'll guys catch you next week with another fun and amazing episode discussion or review or well whatever dope you want to do. I still want to do that Kung Pao review. Mm. But anyway, see ya. Adios. Goodbye. We purposely train him wrong as a joke. My nipples are milk guts. <laughs> <laughs> Eeny, meeny, miny, mo. I wonder where my yellow rubber glove will go. I think we lost Norman. We've broken his fragile sanity. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>